So like there's this idea on like the populist right that like we tried libertarianism and now wokeness has taken over. And I'm like, okay, when did Republicans repeal the Civil Rights Act? Like when did that happen? When did they defund public edu education? Like no, and I, you actually haven't done right. anything close to libertarianism. And now you're making libertarianism the scapegoat right. um, for all these negative trends. Today I'm speaking with Richard Hanania, who is the president of the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology and the author of the new book, Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy. So Richard, first, can you just summarize the book briefly before we get into questions? Uh, sure. So the argument of my book is it's, you know, it, it has two real audiences. So first, people who study international relations, political scientists, there's something in there for them. And there's also, I think, something in there for people who are just interested in American foreign policy more generally. Um, so the way that academics uh, tend to study foreign policy, and this is, this is a, you know, a simplification, but if you're going to have to, you know, generalize about um, the way sort of it's understood in political science, the field of international relations, uh, the idea is that states basically Basically, are rational actors, and rational actors doesn't mean what they do is um, necessarily good for the world, or um, or you know whether their values are consistent with other people's values. But basically, that states seek certain goals, and their behavior can be understood in that context. Um, so basically, the study of grand strategy is sort of a um, is a uh, um, is a sort of uh, corollary of this, and the idea is that diplomatic, economic, and military means tend to be uh, put towards this, put towards the same goals. They're all basically moving the same direction. Um, and I think this view of understanding foreign policy is, is, um, is sort of naive. My main argument um, is that we don't think like this in terms of domestic policy. We don't think that there's a grand strategy of the U.S. government with regards to immigration, uh, with regards to health care, with regards to uh, tax system. It, it's sort of a, um, the, there's a fallacy of seeing a design in international, uh, kind of a design in international relations um, or kind of a, um, you know, kind of a sort of goal-focused behavior, and we tend not to make that mistake in uh, in other areas. So that's you know, the first two chapters are basically the uh, uh, the theoretical, you know, the theoretical case for why a lot of the ways we look at international relations is wrong. Um, that you know, people are interested in academic uh, works; they're interested in sort of thinking about ideas and political philosophy. I think that you know, people will enjoy those chapters. And then most of the rest of the book is basically looking at American foreign policy and asking, does a theory of grand strategy or a theory uh, based on public choice, which I present as an alternative model, does that explain things like when the U.S. Um, US uh, mil uh, troop, presence of, to, troop presence is abroad, um, when we start and, and uh, end various wars, uh, the American sanctions regime, so ma major parts of American foreign policy. And I argue that the public choice uh, model of foreign policy just works better. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's the unitary uh, actor model is not right right now. But wouldn't be true in the future. So you know, like the the countries that have a fucked up foreign policy, where the whole thing is in shambles and contradicts uh, itself, you know, they'll lose out to the countries that actually have a cohesive national strategy. And in the long run, the countries that actually do have um, uh, a cohesive a grand strategy will win, right? Yeah. So this is um, we actually one of the arguments for how you get rationality um, that I. Uh... That I take issue with. I think this is most closely associated with uh, international relations uh, theorist uh, Kenneth Waltz. Um, you know, there's a, so there's a few things you can say about this, right? Like, so the state, you know, the it, it might just go against the nature of of the state, right? Maybe the state is such a big and complicated thing that maybe you get closer to rationality, you get closer to grand strategies at, at, through a sort of a selection process. But it's still an open question how close you uh, you get. Um, you know, and the you know the other thing is, I I would say that there's a lot else going on in the world beyond how states react to one another. So you know, there's um, you know the, the the origins of economic development are a complicated thing, and a state can have a country like the United States can have a lot going for it um, as far as uh, human capital, as far as institutions, and do very well economically. And then um, you know just and, and it can afford to have a sort of irrational foreign policy. There's actually the one one. Um, one possibility is that states that um, tend to have good uh, institutions for economic growth, with you know things like decentralization, um, you know individual freedom, uh, an open society, that might be bad for forming a grand strategy for international relations because you can have interest groups influence foreign policy, and people are worried about their own lives rather than you know what's going on abroad, and the state is uh, limited and can't really enforce its will. So this is a possibility that uh, you know nobody's brought up before, but perhaps you know there there is some kind of tension there where states um, with bad foreign policies will tend to tend to have good um, uh, good economic growth and therefore a lot of geopolitical strength. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it, it's an, one way to read your book that maybe the decline of war has been bad, right? Because when you had war, you know, I got you had the casualties and everything, that's bad. But at least you had to keep countries on their toes and their political institutions couldn't become all uh, messed up. So is it like, is one way to read your book that um, the political institutions in our world have become so uh, sclerotic because there isn't enough war? Um, I mean, so you know, there's not a, uh, war is, you know, on balance bad, but are there, are there good things we can say for war sort of as far as historical development goes? Um, I think that, you know, depending on your politics, if you look at World War One and World War II, a lot happened um, for the expansion of the American federal government, and I, I, don't, I think that's mostly been bad, but if somebody thinks that's good, um, if you're a big supporter of the welfare state and sort of the centralization of, uh, uh, of power in Washington, um, you know, you have to credit World War One and World War Two. I think that's clear from the uh, historical record. Um, so unquestionably war leads to uh, changes. Um, you know, the, pot the potential for war probably um, uh, you know, was, was part of the Cold War and eventually the Soviet Union collapsed. If there was no potential for any kind of conflict there, you know, who knows, maybe the Soviet Union could have, uh, could have existed forever. So unquestionably, um, war is a accelerant and a sort of catalyst for change. And if you think we need a lot of change, maybe you might, uh, <laughs> you, you might distress seeing that you know, the decline of war over time, but change can also go in a negative direction too. Mm -hmm. Now, to what extent are these problems unique to democracies of, you know, concentrated interest being able to pull a uh, government to, um, you know, do counterproductive things. Because if, I mean, if you look at the quote unquote China's grand strategy, right, it's a very centralized system. There's one guy at the top, but, you know, they're doing some very stupid things, like they're fighting over some irrelevant islands with Japan. You know, they're getting into skirmishes with India over some mountain regions. Um, and, you know, but we'll see about the Belt and Road, but, you know, right now it seems like there, there's some place, you wouldn't know more about this than me, but there seems like there's some places where there's cost overruns and where, you know, they're building stuff in places that are relevant. Um, so to what extent are centralized governments able to have a better grant strategy? Uh, so yeah, we, we should be careful not to say, you know, um, having a grant strategy is better or smarter in some uh -huh. way. It's just the, the, the question that I address in the book is whether it's coherent. Uh -huh. uh, whether uh, China, so we can understand China in comparison to the U.S. on these two axes, whether it's, you know, smart or wise versus whether it's coherent. Um, whether it's smart or wise, which I think your question was, was getting at. I mean, uh, China's, uh, you know, blunders and, um, you know, uh, you know, having, um, you know, uh, squabbles with Japan over a few islands. I mean, if you compare that to the U.S. investment in Afghanistan or Iraq, I mean, there's really, you know, we're not really wants to talk about, you know, uh, foreign policy blunders. I mean, the Chinese um, even spending on the military is pretty low. I mean, there's nothing that compares to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, I mean, Syria. I mean, so we have blunder after blunder. Um, and whether it's a Chinese, but whether the Chinese system has more coherence in foreign policy, um, and whether that can be attributed to not, it not being a democracy, um, I think that I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think that the, I think that the you know that the fact that the Chinese basically is China's grand strategy has been not to have much of a foreign policy. I mean, relative to the U.S., you know, not not to take much of you know not to care much about what goes on in most of the world, um, and then you know there does seem to be a concerted effort to sort of uh, push out or push outward and uh, push its weight around within its region which is natural which is what states do as they as they tend to grow um, and so you know do when I look at Chinese foreign policy do I see more coherence than American yes I mean you don't see you know you see China basically inflict the punishment on the nation and there is usually a goal right and then you can usually you know so for example uh, Lithuania I think just uh, I don't know if they recognized Taiwan or they did something with Taiwan China didn't like it so China uh, did something against Lithuania I don't know if Lithuania has a responded or whatever, but basically, I mean, you can understand how this makes sense, right? Um, when the U.S. sanctions somebody, it basically says, we're going to, you know, we're not going to recognize this government. It destroys the economy. It's more total than anything China does. Um, and then it never talks to them again. And, you know, that that's basically the end of it. So, yeah, I mean, that there's uh, there's certainly more coherence and I think more sense to what China's doing than what the U.S. is doing. But to what extent is, is that just because, you know, China isn't powerful enough or doesn't have enough money to waste on debacles like Afghanistan and Iraq? So, like, maybe in, like, 30 years when, or not even 30 years, but, like, a, once their economy is bigger than ours, right? Um, will, will they be making the same kinds of mistakes? I mean, if you look at when was the British uh, Empire most overextended, um, you know, the, the, the peak of colonization was when they weren't fully a democracy, right? Yeah, so, I mean, so countries, even without a lot of resources, can often put a lot of um, 
efforts overseas. So Maoist China, I think, was uh, uh, one of the, um, you know, at least for its per capita level, was the biggest provider of foreign aid in the world. By far, it was giving uh, uh, money for like uh, uh, subsidies in Eastern Europe for countries that were richer than itself. Um, so Maoist China was extremely poor and had an extremely interventionist foreign policy that it invested a lot in. Uh, Russia today um, overinvests in foreign policy, you know, relative to its economic size. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, you know, so the, the U.S. certainly can't afford to do more than China. And by PPP terms, I mean, China has, um, has caught up or passed the United States. So China, I mean, has the potential to do a lot more. I just think it choose, chooses not to. Right. Now, you say in the book that the public doesn't really care uh, about that much about foreign policy, at least in comparison to domestic policy. Does that mean that if the president actually did have a coherent vision of a grand strategy, he could enact it because like, the public is just not going to be paying attention, and if he just like, really wants something, he could do it? I think it depends on the, you know, the costs of what the grand strategy are. If the grand strategy involves sending a lot of troops abroad and taking a lot of casualties, um, that's going to be really hard. Um, if the you know if if it's more along the lines of we're going to crush one nation, um, you know, and you know the, w w how we define grand strategy. There's grand strategy at the macro level, and then there's sort of at the uh, we can think about it as like you know approach to one country. And sometimes we do see that. Like I think the uh, the last administration had a de facto, basically not a de facto, more than a de facto, sort of an intended um, uh, policy of regime change um, towards Iran. Um, and that wasn't that they weren't open about that, but the idea was basically you just you know you just uh, sanction them as much as possible, and you just hope you know they're, they're as less powerful uh, as possible and potentially collapse. And there was a more official uh, strategy of regime change, and they even recognized a different government uh, in Venezuela. Um, so and you know that didn't require any American casualties; it required a lot of uh, suffering in the countries that were uh, that were targeted. Um, but it does seem that the American efforts were put towards um, certain goals. So yes, you're. Right within certain limits, um, presidents do have freedom to do a lot, and people don't care about Iran and they don't care about Venezuela. Um, so there was a lot of uh, yeah, there was a lot of freedom there. Okay, now you say sanctions don't work, intervention doesn't work, but if we look at a country like North Korea, we feel like you know if there was something, we really ought to be able to, uh, to we really ought to do it. Like we really don't want them to have nukes or the capacity to launch nukes uh, to the United States. Um, so if these traditional interventions don't work, is there something you could do about a country like North Korea? Or like, you know, Venezuela is like starving its own people. Yeah. Uh, obviously the sanctions are making it worse, yeah. but like if you wanted to, you know, get rid of Maduro, is there something we could do that is like uh, feasible and it's not counterproductive? Uh, so I mean, each of these cases is, uh... Uh, is sort of uh, unique. So I mean, in North North Korea. I mean, interventions work. I mean, if you know, if you just overthrow a government, you can get rid of them. Um, the um, you know, but the, obviously that would be very costly. In the case of North Korea, for nuclear weapons and even conventional weapons, they have a uh, you know, they have a, a lot of a, you know, a pretty big army. Um, yeah, can we do something about? Um, North Korean, you know, nukes. Um, I think you know one one school of thought is basically that um, that North Korea um, wants nukes because it's afraid of the U.S. Right? It's it's basically defensive. It thinks that the U.S. if not if it's not going to invade it at this point, it's because of nukes. But you know, would like to see the regime fall um, uh, anyway, um, and that's probably that's probably true. Um, and you know, and the question is, do you? Um, you know, and, and the question is, do you uh, uh, accommodate sort of that fear if what you're worried about is nuclear weapons and learn to live with the government? Now, there's another school of thought on North Korea that says basically they want the U.S. out and they want to they want to conquer the South. You know, I don't have insight into uh, the you know the, the thinking of the North Korean regime, so it's it's really hard to say which is the you know which is the correct position. Um, and then on Venezuela, like, is there something we can do um, to you know counteract the uh, uh, you know the, the terrible economic policies um, that the Maduro regime, you know, and and, and the form of the Chavez regime um, have implemented. Um, you know, it's it's very very hard. I mean, the um, I think the, uh, I, the the move towards um, more open markets globally um, has been has been the result of basically people seeing that markets work much better than central planning. I mean, the Soviet Union, the uh, the elites in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe realized that what they were doing was not working, and they basically they moved to a um, capitalist system. It wasn't because Gorbachev, you know, wasn't forced into it. it was, there was nothing. Uh, there was no like rebellion from below or civil war or anything. They just basically decided that the you know, the the, um, the regime had lost legitimacy, even if not from the people, at least from you know from those at the top. Um, and for the, especially for the Soviet satellites. Um, and so that doesn't mean that um, that movement's gonna be, you know, the movement is gonna be um, consistent in the direction 
um, you know, markets all the time everywhere. So you have to understand sometimes some places are going to go in the opposite direction. Um, I think, well, you know, one thing the U.S. you know the U.S. does have do some very harmful things to Latin America that I think they uh, probably shouldn't do. I mean, the drug war. I mean, these countries. Uh, 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 so much of their politics revolves around stopping the flow of drugs and because that's what the U.S. demands of like, you know, who cares about drugs? Is that worth having a civil war over? No, of course not. And, you know, Mexico and these other uh, uh, countries in Latin America would probably be much better off if we didn't, uh, if we didn't do that. Um, I think that uh, there's also a sense of a lot of U.S. meddling as far as like democratization and human rights, which people think these are generally good things and all else being equal, they might be good things, but we are not in a position to know you know, like like if you're a country that has a serious violence problem, right? And that's like you know the first, uh, you know, that's the prerequisite to everything else, to peaceful living, to growth, to everything is getting violence under control. And Latin America countries have really bad problems with it. Um, and then somebody comes from abroad and says, you know, you have to fight crime or you have to fight cartels in a way consistent with our human rights norms. Um, you know, that's something that sounds good, um, but might not actually, you know, might not actually be conducive to getting the best possible policy at the at the local level. So I think I think there's a lot of meddling and sort of a hubris about what we know and what's best for these countries. Um, and I think that moving away from that would probably uh, help them solve their problems in their own way. Mm -hmm. Now, you say in the book that one of the agents that are influencing American foreign policy are foreign governments like Israel and Saudi Arabia. But if they are able to actually influence American policy in a way that is good for them as a nation, um, doesn't that make these countries rational actors then that have a cohesive grant strategy? Yeah, I mean, so so it's something I don't go into the book is, and we'll, well, me and you have just talked about it now, sort of what countries, when countries have, you know, can act like more like unitary actors and when they don't. Um, and in the case of, I think, I think that one of the determinants of whether a country acts with, you know, a strategy in a certain domain is how important the issue is to them, right? So Iran is much more important to Israel and Saudi Arabia um, than it is to America, right, by many, many times. And so you could imagine Israel and Saudi Arabia do have something resembling a strategy when it comes to Iran, and the U.S. Is, has a sort of open political system and is liable to be influenced um, by those countries. Um, and often it's not even, you know, you know, it's, um, you could even, you know, question whether it's always those countries or it's a faction within those countries. But yeah, I, I do take the point that, uh, um, this, you know, often there's something closer to a strategy in what other countries are doing just because they're closer to the problem and it actually just matters a lot more to them. Mm -hmm. And in the book you say that uh, when it comes to foreign policy, special interests matter more than ideas and then ideas are after the fact justifications for what these special interests want. But uh, when you talk about domestic policy, you seem to be making the opposite point that actually it's the ideology uh, that matters more, and then uh, economic self-interest actually determines very little about uh, people's political preferences. Uh, so why why is there a difference between foreign policy and domestic policy? Uh, so that I mean, so my view on domestic policy, I mean, it's, so there's uh, you know the, at the level of the voter, um, there's there's I think very little in terms of objective interest because the voter doesn't have a, a stake in the, you know a stake in their vote doesn't determine the outcome of the election. So one of the consistent findings of political science is basically that um, people's economic circumstances do a very very poor job of predicting their uh, their political orientation. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or, or whatever, your, your economic situation is not very predictive, you know, not even close compared to demographic factors and you know, cultural attitudes and, and things like that. Um, now, when it comes to policy, you know, there's, I think there's a, you know, there's a, a few different kinds of policy. So the, um, all, most things there is, you know, the public opinion is just not paying attention to. Does public opinion have a really strong view on uh, the nature of the tax code or, um, or uh, you know the exact details of environmental regulations, or you know whatever. I mean, you the same thing in foreign policy with you know something like NATO expansion. Um, the uh, you know so the, the, I think this is this basically you know both international and domestic international relations and domestic politics. Um, the uh, the uh, interest groups you know have a have a huge role to play. Now the um, uh, when it comes to um, certain issues that are particularly salient. So in the domestic context. This is something like social security, like people are gonna notice like if you cut their social security benefits or the Medicare or, or something like that. You know, there's not a lot of taxes, you know, same thing. There's not a lot of issues that are exactly like this. Um, but here public opinion matters and here you have to you have to tread carefully if you're a politician. And it's the same thing in foreign policy when there's a cost that when you're gonna do something that's potentially very costly to the country and it becomes a major political issue, then, um, 
then uh, it then public opinion matters a lot more. So you needed you know public opinion to be on your side to go into Iraq, right? There was overwhelming support for the Iraq War at the time. Now, one of the unique things I think about foreign policy that makes gives leaders sort of more freedom of movement compared to domestic politics. And if you're going to say what's the difference in sort of my understanding of politics between domestic issues and international issues, it's probably this is probably one of the most important. Um, it's the it's the it's the fact that basically public. Uh, uh, public opinion is more easily manipulated by leaders in foreign re in, the, in foreign relations, right? I don't think there's a way to sell, um, you know, getting rid of social security that's going to work with the American public. Um, there is, e you could easily sell some country as a threat to the United States because most uh, Americans don't have experience with foreign countries. They don't have independent knowledge. You know, these places like Ukraine or uh, Russia or Estonia or anything is basically exists as an abstraction. And why we think of one country as a friend and one country as an ally and one country as an enemy. I mean, that's basically, that's media coverage, that signals coming from elites. Um, and so it's, you know, if you look at like going back to the Iraq, Iraq war, I mean, nobody was thinking about attacking Iraq, you know, right after 9-11, but basically the Bush administration um, had, you know, high approval ratings in the aftermath of the attack. Um, there was a full-on, uh, basically, PR campaign to not explicitly tie Saddam to 9-11, um, but basically tie him to Al-Qaeda, you know, would make people be afraid of uh, uh, WMDs. I mean, about, even though the Bush administration never said this, I mean, there was a, I think it was a majority or a plurality of the public actually believed Saddam was personally involved in 9-11, you know, which there was never any evidence for. But it was easy to sort of lead people in that direction, um, just because, you know, who, who knows anything about Saddam Hussein or, or Iraq, right? People have to sort of uh, trust their leaders on these things. And maybe that's getting harder as like polarization um, is more extreme and people don't trust their leaders anymore. Um, but there's still just more room to maneuver on foreign policy than there is on a lot of domestic issues. Mm -hmm. You see in the book near the end that one of the ways to fix this should be that we um, better regulate a, a foreign lobbyist in the government and, you know, um, funding of, you know, let's say defense contractors onto think tanks and uh, research institutions. Uh, do you think the same should be true of domestic policy? So we should limit the, how, I mean, this is kind of a leftist agenda of limiting how much money there is in politics, or is this unique to foreign policy? So, I mean, I, I sort of throw those ideas out there as sort of institutional fixes that people can think about. I am, you know, I am not, um, you know, I don't think I come back, come down and say, you know, this this is something to fix it. I, I just think that people should be thinking in terms of institutional changes rather than, um, are, you know, arguing, you know, just sort of operating in the realm of ideas. Um, I think that, yeah, and so they, but, I, but, you know, I, I think I probably would support, you know, uh, some limits on um, lobbying um, for people who worked in the government for, uh, uh, like in the Pentagon. Um, does that make, does that, should we do that for, um, for all of uh, politics? You know, because I, you know, I'm the, I, there's not really, a, I don't think I have a principled answer here. I think that I think that the foreign, you know, the foreign policy basically in the establishment has had a negative influence on American politics and sort of on domestic, on domestic politics. I think the influence of money on politics has been sort of mixed. You know, the idea of campaign finance reform, for example, is you get money out of politics, but if you get money out of politics, who gets the press coverage? Well, you know, it's basically the governments and the party. So it's some other small group of people determining sort of the, uh, uh, um, the lay of the land and what you know what the uh, um, uh, the lay of the land and what the uh, sort of what, what the parameters of the debate are um, I think that you know um, one thing we should do is I mean I, I, I am I'm less um, less hesitant or less conflicted about endorsing sort of a cultural change so for example uh, in the areas like for example when um, you inter you know when you're interviewing a um, a formal general on you know a uh, in a newspaper or on TV, you don't just say this is a former general. You say this guy is also on the board of this corporation or that corporation. I mean that that I think changes the entire focus um, of the uh, you know of the conversation. And that was um, yeah, the Washington Post wrote, wrote a story about this. How basically this is the norm. And I I uh, I was interviewed for that for that story. I, I you know I think there's no good reason not to do that. Um, I think part of my what my book does is not just sort of institutional or legal fixes. It's also so just you know, telling people think about this in a different way and having sort of this cultural change, which I think takes away a lot of the credibility of the people influencing foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, okay, so let's talk about experts now. So in your article in uh, Tadlock and Taliban, you point out many ways in which we have established, um, established fields. And if you look at the track record of societal trends associated with those fields, um, you know, things like suicides, when you 
talk about psychology or crime when you talk about criminology, or obviously, you know, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan when you talk about international relations, you know, uh, things have been getting worse. But if you're there, if that's the standard you're going to apply, is how do the societal trends associated with the field uh, do? Then you must think that um, uh, you know global poverty research and uh, de development economics must be amazing, right? Because we've seen like a billion people lifted out of poverty or more since 1990. So um, if, if you're applying the same standard, then wouldn't wouldn't it imply that some fields have been doing extraordinarily well? Well, yeah, actually, I do think that. I think I, I think that um, you know the, the reduction in poverty. Um, has come from uh, China first, and then and then India. And if you ask economists, you know, are Chinese and uh, Indian policies better or worse than they were in the 1960s and 1970s? You could say that they're definitely moving in the direction of sort of the consensus of economics. So I actually do think economics is a little bit, you know, more of a serious uh, science than than other fields. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Actually, I think economics looks good um, uh, in the context of the, uh, the decline of poverty over time. So then, would you credit the fact that there hasn't been a nuclear war? Is that a, is that something you put in the pro column for international relations? Um, yeah, that one, uh, you know, I think is I think is different because we, we you know we poverty is something we can look at. And we can say it's always existed, and now it's you know it's getting better. And so for nuclear weapons, it's not like we had an era of like a lot of nuclear wars, and and now we don't, right? We had nuclear weapons; they were invented, and that's consistent with a story where just these weapons were too horrible um, for anybody to use. But I think if you're going to have like a you know a steel man argument of say the case for American empire, it would be something along the lines of, you know, I, I don't believe that, you know, American hegemony has kept, it is what basically has given us, uh, uh, you know, relative peace since 1945, but I think it would be a, a kind of like a Burkean argument that, you know, the international system is very complex and it's working out well and just don't change anything, you know, too radical because potentially, you know, we, we, there's just so much we don't know about what the consequences of that would be. Well, well how would you respond to that, by the way? Um, I would say that, you know, I would say that you, know, you have to take different parts of American foreign policy and I would be more sort of uh, open to get rid of, uh, you know, doing away with certain of them than others. So for, so for example, regime change wars that's, and sanctions, I think those are the low hanging fruit. I don't think that, I don't think you can make the case that, I think you can make the case that these are, you know, these have terrible effects on the world and I don't think you can make the case that they contribute to global order um, or anything like that. You know, overthrowing governments is a huge source of uh, international disorder. And and then, you know, as far as, you know, um, whether the, you know, U.S., um, you know, the sort of U.S. Uh, hegemony has been keeping peace of that, then you would move on to, say, the commitments to NATO and, uh, you know, the, the presence in Japan and South Korea, and you would say, okay, you know, you, we've relative, we've kept the, you know, we've uh, kept the peace in a relative way there. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, I think you have to sort of look, I think that there's a good reason to think that it's not necessarily the influence of the U.S. that's behind the decline of violence, because you look at areas, even in countries where it's like, they don't have, um, you know, you look at uh, diets where they don't have um, uh, any relationship with the U.S. on either side, just war is just down basically across the board everywhere. And you could say, well, that's all the American system, but I think it's, it's hard to figure out exactly um, how you know, the U.S. having a presence in East Asia or, um, or uh, Eastern Europe, um, you know, that makes Africans stop fighting each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that everyone basically is not doing war anymore just gives you sort of a, this, uh, I think, backs up John Mueller, uh, what John Mueller thinks or what Steven Pinker thinks, um, that's basically, you know, we're in the realm of ideas and people just think war is stupid. And from that perspective, you know, the U.S. is sort of an outlier in how much it uses war, and then the U.S. is potentially a source of, uh, of instability. I think I would lean towards that view, but I, yeah, I'll acknowledge that sort of the Burkean view of, you know, things have been working out relatively well, um, let's not mess with it. I mean, another thing that hasn't been working out well, actually, the number of uh, 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 being killed in, like, civil wars and civil conflicts has not gone down the way international war has. And if you look at who's behind a lot of the civil wars that have the huge death rates, I mean, that's the United States. Right. So not everything is actually working out well. I think uh, keeping order within countries, you mentioned Latin America, a lot of these things are, are classified as high crime rates. They could pretend, they could, um, uh, they could um, theoretically be classified as civil wars. And if you think American foreign policy is having a negative effect in Latin America, I mean, that's another contributor to the violence abroad. Um, so yeah, that, that, you know, that, I think that's the response to it. But I, I, you know, again, I acknowledge there's, there potentially could be something to that argument. So I think one of the other things to see when Pinker thinks is behind the decline of violence is also like international alliances like NATO 
Um, now, now to have is a point against that, which is that it, you know, while in the short term it makes us more safe, in the long term, you know, you're like if Russia invades, uh, you know, some uh, North Macedonia or something, then we had to go to war, and then it starts World War Three. Um, so, do you buy Pinker's argument that actually these uh, American alliances have created a safer world? Uh, so I haven't. Um, I read Pinker, um, you know, when it came out, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, about a decade ago. I don't remember him having that argument. Um, about NATO, I, I, I don't recall it being all along. I'll take your word for it. Um, I could be wrong. I thought it was in uh, Enlightenment now, but yeah. Okay, so yeah, I also yeah, I also read Enlightenment now. I, I don't remember. You know, could be, could be better yeah. or not. Um, it, it's a po possible argument, even if it's not. Okay, yeah, even if it's not Pinker's argument, yeah, yeah. So let's let's see. Yeah, I'll just take the argument. Um, yeah, I, so NATO. I mean, the, the argument for NATO making the world safer. Okay, first of all, I mean, the, the, during you know the uh, justification. You know, I think. The justifications for NATO, right? But originally, were there was potentially a Soviet uh, land invasion of of Europe, right? Um, and you know, the Soviet Union is gone, right? And so the question is, like, you know, is there um, a potential for all we're talking about is Russia? I don't know, like, what else we'd be talking about, right? Like, that North Africa is going to invade Europe or something. It's, it's you know, the only potentially thing I think we're talking about here is, is Russia. Um, and you know, I, I, I it, it seems not to. I mean, it's, it seems there doesn't seem to be sort of a um, you know, there, there's a capability and there's a question of will, right? Russia is just not um, that you know economically positioned to try to take on Germany or France or um, uh, Western Western Europe. It cares a lot about Ukraine and it cares a lot about Georgia. And you know, I think it's I think it's pretty clear that Russia, you know, the instability is due to Russian fears over. Um, the expansion of NATO. So in Georgia, basically, the uh, the government uh, launched a um, uh, launched a war to try to take back um, uh, some regions that were um, that were uh, sort of breakaway regions with alliances towards Russia. And the idea was basically they thought the United States had their back, and they were trying to settle this issue to get into uh, to get into NATO. There was a great uh, uh, Adam Tooze uh, Substack on this um, about the history of uh, Russia and NATO. So it's it's clear that there's a sort of, that there's been sort of a destabilizing influence. Russia's fear that these places would um, uh, become part of NATO, I think, has driven a lot of this uh, sort of behavior abroad. I think ultimately, though, what it, I think what it's really about, actually, at its root, and like what, where the antagonism comes from, I think that the U.S. sees Russia as a potential for regime change. I think it considers the current government illegitimate, and I think Russia doesn't, it probably doesn't think that like the U.S. is going to um, go into Ukraine and add them to NATO and Georgia, and then like launch an invasion of Russia. You know, that seems very unlikely. I think that the, the idea is is basically there's an ideological war against the idea of the legitimacy of the Russian state as a non-democracy that has a different form of government, um, different ideological ideas about you know just different things than the U.S. does, um, and I think they're they're reacting to that. So I think I think this idea of sort of a, uh, this idea of regime change is sort of beneath the surface and deriving a lot of the tensions. Mm, interesting. All right, going back to the topic of expertise. Um, you, you criticize the focus on peer review uh, and uh, specialized knowledge. It, it seems that some fields, uh, that, that seems like a valid criticism, right? Uh, it seems like there isn't uh, that much um, um, specialized knowledge there to begin with. But in fields like, let's say, particle physics or computational complexity, uh, it seems like academic bureaucracy and incentives have worked, and I expect the people at the top of that field to be the, like, the best in the world at that, right? So, but it seems like the same kind of academic institution uh, as you know, like a field like uh, international relations, right? Uh -huh. So why, why are the, the two different? So I think, um, I, I do say in my uh, experts piece, I think I say this, uh, uh, that uh, it, it's basically, you know, I'm focusing on the social sciences um, because that's what I know best. But, but you said economics works well, right? Uh, and that's yeah, and, and economics works relatively well. I think, um, yeah, I mean, we could, we could talk about why, I mean, that, that, that's an interesting question too. Um, but, um, you know, I think, uh, so like uh, Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb would say that actually um, the peer review process doesn't work that well. He has some data on like where the big, you know, Innovations in science comes from, and he tends to think it comes more from the uh, the private sector. So I don't know if that if that's right or wrong. The something um, you know, if you look at something like it's it's complicated, something like the mRNA vaccine. Um, you know, they couldn't get the the publications. It was based on into peer into the top peer reviewed journals, um, and then it took you know Pfizer and Moderna. And, you know, it, it seems like there was um, uh, you know, there's a New York. It seems complicated because there was did belong on some university research in some ways and government funding. Um, I think you know, one of the big differences between the social sciences. And the hard science. I mean, there's a few differences. The first one is there is um, there is some connection to reality.
reality, right? You can you can design the mRNA vaccine. You could take it out of you know you can go even if you're rejected by the peer-reviewed paper, you could take it to a pharmaceutical company. They have an incentive to find out whether you're right. It can go on but we're there in the real world. It can work, and then that changes sort of the ideas in um, economics. In in um, social science, it's you know, a few things. It's it's more complex. So sometimes in some ways, it's harder to know what actually works and what doesn't. We don't we don't do um, like randomized experiments on, on big things. We do like um, like polling questions, but not on like, you know, uh, you know, this state had this econ economic reform and this state had this other economic reform. We, we don't do it uh, anything, anything like that. And I think part of the reason we don't do that, and this is another, this is the second big reason why um, social science is, is you know, so, so hard, is because there's not as much social desirability bias. People don't have, you know, deep-seated beliefs about the best way to get a vaccine. I guess some people do, they say that already vaccine is a scary, but in generally about uh, in general about these physical things, right? People don't have strong beliefs about the way they want the world to work, right? And when it comes to the social sciences, people have very, very strong um, ideas about the way the world the way the world should work. And when you combine that um, with a lack of accountability, with a, account of, you know, with, with a lack of any real world test in the form of, you know, markets or, or uh, some kind of, uh, you know, real experimentation, um, people can just, you know, believe whatever they want or believe whatever, um, you know, um, some kind of like vested interest, like the, like the State Department and, the, you know, the Pentagon bureaucracy, basically whoever's in power um, wants to believe. Um, and so this is why social, uh, social science is hard and this is why um, social desirability uh, bias is, I think, the enemy in the search for truth. Now, one thing about economics is I think it's more of a uh, male-dominated field. It's a more, um, it, you know, if they have a, a mathematical um, sort of requirements that are more stringent, I think that weeds out a lot of people. I think it's it's more of a sort of a, I think that, you know, there's a sort of, a, you know, there's complaints from other disciplines that economics is a little bit mean and aggressive. When I was in, um, uh, I got my PhD in political science, I was, you know, surprised to find that sometimes, you know, somebody's theory would just fall apart and then everyone, and like other people would not just say, okay, this is wrong, go study something else. They would be like, oh, it's okay, just, you know, adjust it this way and then like nobody you know there was always I, I always felt like people were treating others with sort of kid gloves right I think there was a culture in the other fields and this is political science and probably much worse in other fields of not sort of this sort of a willingness to you know to really um, hurt feelings and to you know and to, uh, you know just willingness to be wrong I think economics has done that better than other fields and I think there's a movement to make um, I've been talking to other economics uh, people in economics who agree with this there's been a movement to make economics like other fields and that would potentially be a, uh, that would potentially be disastrous right right but now um, it doesn't seem clear to me that even before uh, calls for diversity dumbed down academia that things were that much better um, you know there were like fads like communism or um, um, uh, or disarmament that uh, were popular in academia and you know like if you look at the Vietnam War it was waged by people who had you know like Kissinger, McNamara, people uh -huh. who had degrees from prestigious universities and you know they were white and male but they were still you know they still were disconnected from the outside world yeah. so have, have, have like newer developments in academia actually made it worse? Uh, well, no. I mean, white white males can can have you know the same pathologies as any other group. Right, right. Um, the uh, yeah, I, I think the international you know the the, the, the dumbing down of academia, um, you know, I think is a problem. You know, work Kissinger and these you know these guys. Um, you know, if you look at the Vietnam War, you know, it's very, it's, it's actually very interesting because everyone sort of knew from like, you know, John, uh, from the Johnson administration, the Nixon administration, that basically, you know, they were, um, you know, that it wasn't winnable, that what they were saying to the public um, wasn't true. And I think that, you know, that if you look at like the historical record of what politicians were saying personally, they were amazingly, um, uh, explicit in their willingness to admit to themselves and those around them that they were doing stuff for political reasons, right? So I think they were responding to, um, uh, I think they were responding to um, basically uh, a political pressure and basically uh, you know public opinion and sometimes using public opinion for their own ends. Um, I you know I don't think if you took. Um, professors in international relations and did like whatever that the equivalent of that would have been and whether they supported the, uh, Vietnam. Um, I, I don't think so. I think the big the big names, like the ones who were not connected to the government, right? So Kissinger, I mean, it's hard because he's like, you know, he's a guy who's in academia, but also like in and out of government, right? And, you know, like it, it's, 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 you wouldn't expect that person to have like, 
you know, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, because if he had a different views, basically, he wouldn't be in government. Yeah. And that's the issue. He, his views had, he had to be selected um, to, a, to, to at least be tolerable um, to whoever, you know, the president happened to be at, at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the, these, the, I, I, um, uh, I think the dumbing down of academia, I think the move away from sort of um, explicit, uh, sort of a more uh, hard standards, like just basically being able to meet some standard of uh, mathematical ability, you know, the, the rise of, you know, cancel culture against free speech, all these things are harmful, doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of pathologies before, and yeah, we can, we can see that definitely. Yeah, you know, because whether expertise has gotten better Overall, I mean, I think that, you know, so if you look at a political scientist from the 19, you know, look at just some other fields from the 1960s or 1970s, and you look at political science today, if you go to Twitter, um, and, you know, there's a, so there's like a, uh, uh, like a, a subject to a political scientist, so it's like a good gauge of like what the most prominent political scientists are saying, and it's all stupid like graphs, like democracy has gone down 16.2% since Republicans took power in this state. It's really, really stupid. I mean, you get the, you know, the mean, the median political scientists from 1960s, 1970s, there's nothing that ridiculous. So I do think, you know, it probably has gotten worse. Um, but okay, so we would, uh, the problems you're pointing out with academia seem uh, like they're inherent to an institution that is disconnected from the market and also to like something that can be empirically measured. But we would like to have expert knowledge in fields like uh, international relations or criminology or psychology, right? Um, so is there any way to start up institutions that can study these sort of um, um, ambiguous topics in a way that actually adds insight uh, to the way we legislate? Um, you know, do we... Do we need expert expertise? Do we even need expertise in international relations or criminology or psychology? You know, I, I tend to believe that the the cost. You know, I, you know, I tend to believe that the costs are more. Um, I tend to believe the costs are, you know, that they outweigh the benefits actually here. I think a lot, I think if you rely on common sense for crime, uh, for controlling crime and some basic statistics, right, um, I think you're better than, than the field of criminology. I would definitely test, you know, I, I would definitely, uh, uh, you know, take the idea, you know, I think there's an idea in like the public that, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, want to stop crime and for, you know, come down very hard on crime. And I think that's, you know, maybe more controversial among criminologists. But I think the problems, I, actually, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I haven't done any survey of criminology. But this is part of the problem in that you have this field called criminology. And even if it, like, arrives at something that's, like, you know, uh, that's true or logical, you know, or they have, like, uh, some unambiguous finding, the people, there will always be criminologists who politicians who want to do something else will rely on. And they will go and they will, you know, find those people. So having this category called criminology and unless we're going to like survey the field and just do, you know, who knows if that will work, but unless you're going to like survey the field and then just do whatever they consist of the field, you're going to end up the media politicians, they're going to be selecting um, the people that they want during the COVID stuff. You know, they always say experts say this, experts say that. But you look at the, um, you know, the something like the Great Barrington Declaration, and I, I just heard about it in the media, I thought these people were kooks and nobodies. And then I went and looked at their credentials, they were like Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, and somehow when the media cites expertise, it's never these people. Right, it's always the most hysterical person possible um, pushing for some kind of restriction. Um, so I think the idea, you know, expertise, you know, potentially can be valuable, um, but the idea of expertise can be harmful, and that basically, you know, gives gives uh, certain people um, power who want to do things, you know, more sort of legitimacy to do things that are uh, irrational. Now I think that, like, you know, at a, at a broader level, you know, I trust. I trust you know things like prediction markets, like economic markets, things that are um, that don't rely on credentials but rely on track records of getting things right. And I would you know agree with Robin Hanson and others who who would you know cheer for these things to uh, have potentially have more of an effect on policy making or the way we think about issues. Okay, now let's talk about politics. So you say that one of the reasons that liberals has been winning is because liberals just care more, more about politics. But how does that explain why um, why things have shifted more liberal over the last few decades? Is it just that conservatives have started started caring less about politics, that liberals have started caring more about politics? What's changed? Uh, actually, uh, to a certain extent, uh, yes. So in 2016, there was a huge uh, mobilization effect on the left. So I, I do have a uh, in our uh, substack called 2016, the, the turning point, I just use 2016 for, for convenience. But basically, if you look at like 2010 versus um, like 2016 to 2020, and like your probability, for example, of having um, attended a protest or signed a petition if you were conservative versus liberal, uh, it was maybe you were two or three times more likely as a liberal in 2010 by 2016 to 2020. I mean, it was, it was multiples of that. It was something like, you know, 10 times more likely to have done these things. Um, so I think that um, national policy 
politics and sort of the mood has a lot to do with it. I think Trump mobilized a lot of people on the left. He did not, he mobilized a lot of voters on like on the right, like low propensity voters who like wouldn't otherwise vote came out and voted for Trump. And it was, just, it was pretty good for Republicans and they were concentrated in certain states. And that tended to be good for Republicans politically or at least, you know, mixed bag. While I think Trump did a, a terrible job of um, sort of uh, motivating people who are, uh, you know, activists or sort of people who would be bureaucrats or lawyers or, you know, the people who actually make policy on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, he, he really turned those people off um, and made them, you know, if anything, made them more liberal. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that, you know, the uh, change in engagement over time is part of the story. So I'm wondering how this theory explains why certain institutions are especially more liberal. Uh, take, for example, uh, big tech, right? Um, or compared to like a, a company like Walmart, right? Now, I, like I, I don't expect that if I, you know, went to Walmart headquarters, I'd see a whole bunch of like BLM posters. But if I go to like Facebook and Facebook office, I, I bet I'll see a few uh, things like that, or sure. like diversity is our strength or something like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, but both of these companies uh, have faced pressure from, you know, liberal employees. Both of these companies have to face civil rights lawsuits. And, um, it, and it, it's not like in the fang companies, you have a bunch of people who have given up um, high salaries in order to have a, a position of cultural influence because they're making a lot of money there, right? Yeah. So it's not like journalism or something. So what explains why big tech especially is super woke? Yeah, so big tech is such an interesting case because um, until 2015 and, 20, and 2016, there was calls, there was a lot of calls for censorship. Um, and from the media. And Twitter basically didn't censor anybody until 2015, and Facebook too. Um, so basically the, you know, the big tech was a lot less woke than the media wanted them to be. Um, I think that there was basically a lot of political pressure that came down on them from, from the top. I think Mark Zuckerberg is, um, you know, Jack Dorsey are relatively not woke people compared to a lot of elites in America. Um, when, you know, when tech, um, you know, and I think I, you know, I think other other people have made this point. Um, basically, when you know the, the initial generation of you know leaders in tech, um, they were the people who were the sort of the pioneers. They were not conformists, right? Um, they tended to be less. Um, you know, they, they tended to do their own thing, just sort of, and they would have their own political and social views, right? Um, and then when tech sort of became established, it started to, uh, you know, it started to draw people who are more conformist. And that's why, uh, you know, these people have put forth the argument um, uh, that uh, basically crypto now is more right-wing than tech because crypto is sort of the next, you know, cutting edge non thing that non-conformists are doing. So I think tech, I mean, it started out, I think, with a more of a libertarian ethos, and it sort of became the establishment, it became the, you know, sort of the thing for, High conformist people to do, um, and uh, you know I think that that's probably it's uh, explains its wokeification um, over time. Um, and then like something like you know Walmart. I mean I, you know I, and I think you know the, the just sort of the ether right now is if you're a, if you're an idealistic person, it's easier to be idealistic on the left than the right. I don't think the right has done a good job of uh, providing sort of an idealistic vision that appeals to a lot of people. When I think if you go work for Walmart, you know your your, your views are more maybe you know you you get enough meaning from, you know, just getting the logistics right and getting people the goods and services they need. So I think that attracts a completely different kind of person. Sorry, I, I don't think I understood the difference between Walmart and Big Tech and Nugget. Like, but in Big Tech, you're also doing stuff like, you know, shipping a product that, like, you can get meaning out of that as well, right? Yeah. Um, and then in both those cases, they're, like, getting older. In Big Tech, they're getting becoming older institutions that attract conformists. So sure. why is Big Tech more, uh, more woke? Yeah, so Amazon, you're working on, like, logistics, right? I mean, uh, Facebook and Google and, uh, and Twitter are sort of more in the, you know, because they're not actually producing anything, I think, you know, you could say that they're, they have to tell themselves a story about why they're doing something good for the world. And some people, you know, believe in that story. Um, you know, they, uh, they convince themselves of it or they believe in it uh, or they don't. So like this kind of like, um, you know, like the Google thing, like don't be evil, right? I mean, the, this is sort of idea that they were doing something social and revolutionary, I think was part of the ethos from the start. While Walmart, you know, they want to get you lower prices and, you know, make your life better. But I don't think it ever had that idea that you were going to fundamentally revolutionize society by having more Walmarts, right? All right. Yeah, it's kind of analogous to American foreign policy in a way that like, uh, um, you know, like uh, Google is something like uh, America and that we have, they have an explicit creed yeah. and then they had to do stuff to, in, to further that creed that actually uh, might make things worse. That's interesting. So you write that one thing that your theory can somewhat uh, help vindicate is um, authoritarian populism. Not that you necessarily support it, but just the idea that 
Um, you know, you, you can have a right-wing government that pushes back on the, the liberal elite who just care more than conservatives, even if they're not more numerous. Um, I wonder if, um, compared to this, you think uh, th th this theory also vindicates uh, libertarianism more, because in that case, you just, first of all, you don't have the funds for this rent-seeking elite to be able to yeah. survive. Uh, so, you know, there's less journalism, academia, and also there's like less these elites can do to like actually coerce people without the help of government. Yeah, so you're, you're getting at sort of my, uh, you know, the sort of the motivation behind a lot of my writing on American politics, which I, you know, I'm disturbed by wokeness. Um, and I think that the, the fight against wokeness has been confused and not very effective, which is, you know, it's almost like, you know, that has to be self-evident because wokeness has gone so far and, you know, won so much. Um, and so I'm thinking about, you know, the different ways you can go about sort of working against it. So, I, you know, I, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not coming down on, you know, I, I think that, you know, like to just have one sort of thing, it's either libertarianism or it's populist, you know, more authoritarian. I think that, you know, the words like those are very uh, uh, sort of selectively used. But whether it's like a more interventionist or non-intervention, I, I, you know, I don't think that like the ideal response would be a pure version um, of either of these, right? Um, so I, for what you could say for the libertarian perspective is that, and Robbie Swole the reason, uh, that's, that's the lesson he took from my article, um, was basically like, you know, they're gonna, you know, whatever you try to pass, you say the government has to be like this or it has to be like that, it's gonna get around it. Um, and one, one thing they can't get around is you cut off their funding. You stop giving money to the universities, there's, there's, you know, they, they have, they're not going to go out. You know, they just don't have the funding anymore to do the stuff that they want to do. You pass a law saying they have to be politically fair and give conservatives a fair hearing. Well, I mean, who, who do you think is going to be interpreting that law and deciding what a fair hearing is and what political discrimination is and, and all that? So yeah, there, there's something to that. I mean, shrinking, like saying, you know, the government and sort of these. Um, institutions that are under the influence of you know bureaucrats and activists just shrinking their role in society rather than remaking them um, remaking those institutions I mean there's something to be said of, uh, uh, for that um, but then like you know it depends on like what you want right if you are really bothered by um, you know, if you're really bothered by the direction of the culture, um, and, you know, and the fact that you know um, activists, you know, are uh, are um, uh, you know propagandizing or or people who basically are you know um, just just the market. I mean, the, you know, whoever's or whoever you know, the media institutions and you know popular music and culture. Um, if you're upset that they're you know they're selling sexual promiscuity to children, for example, um, you know you might you know have a you know. Have, Come, you know, you might have a more uh, forceful response to that. I mean, you can you, there's, you're, there's probably, um, you know, there's probably not a answer within the confines of libertarianism, or it's very hard. I mean, you could set up your own private community and go off and do something. All right, there, there, you know, there, potentially there's something there. But you know, you could potentially say, you know, I don't, I don't like what's considered art now. I don't like what's considered pop culture, and you might just say, well, that's the that, that's the only potential thing you can do. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure I follow. Like, if you're a parent, right? Like, just don't buy your kid porn. I guess you had to buy them a smartphone at some point, but you have to buy them a smartphone. I mean, they have friends if all their if you if you can't you know you can only afford to send them to a public school and everyone else is watching porn in the bathroom. I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, the people are influenced by that, right? So right. It's, it's not you know I don't think it's as easy as turn off the TV. I think we all exist within this culture, and you know, there's a uh, you know what other people do does affect you. Right, right, but um, I guess I'm skeptical of t to the extent of what uh, right-wing government can actually influence the culture. And that brings me to the next topic I want to talk to you about, which is uh, fertility, right? So you're more optimistic about what uh, countries like China and Hungary can do about fertility. Yeah. Um, but uh, it seems to me that if like giving people checks doesn't get them to fuck, like I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know if like, you know, banning makeups on guys is, is gonna actually make a difference. Well, I mean, so you look at, uh, you, you, you step back and you look at sort of what correlates with high fertility levels, right? And it seems more clearly to be associated with culture than economic situation. As humans have become more able to afford kids, they've tended to have less of them, right? So this is a pretty strong argument um, against it being an economic issue, um, or largely an economic issue as a driver of differential fertility rates. Um, and then you know you look at things like so religiosity are you know very important. And the question is, can government um, influence um, culture, right? Um, I, I see no reason to think it can't. I think one thing, civil rights law, I think one of my you know, main arguments on civil rights law is it actually did influence the culture. And even that wasn't 
that heavy handed compared to say what the Chinese government could do uh, potentially. Um, so yeah, if you take the idea that fertility is a cultural issue and that government can't have an influence on culture, then it basically follows that government, if it wanted to, if it wanted to um, change the fertility rate or potentially a lot of other things, you know, it can do, th do so through the control of the culture. Right, right. Uh, but um, I guess one, one reason to be optimistic is, uh, or, or depending on your perspective, to be optimistic about um, China's fertility is, you know, like, listen, look at what they did with COVID, where they were able to, like, just bolt people down in their houses until, like, there were zero cases in the area. Yeah. And if they, you know, the Western countries couldn't do that, so they couldn't get the COVID under control. So right. what if they did something similar on fertility? But there doesn't seem to be some obvious uh, analogous human rights violation that you do to, like, um, increased fertility that um, uh, that the West is not willing to try, right? It's just like, what are you going to do that's analogous to? Sure, sure there is. You can, you know, ban all antinatalist propaganda. You can make the education system just be nothing but, you know, about how you should have children to, you know, for the fatherland. You could, you know, tax single people and uh, unmarried people at 100% and, you know, give all their money to. to so, there, you know, there's tons of stuff you could do. Yeah, I mean, you, know, enough, yeah. you know, whether that's good, you know, whether that goes to like something like zero COVID is worth, you know, the fact that China did it is pretty impressive. Right. Well, whether it was worth it, you know, I think, you know, they've prob probably gone overboard at this point, right? So you can debate whether it's worth it. But I think, you know, yeah, having a competent and authoritarian government sort of opens up different possibilities. Mm -hmm. By the way, so you think, um, by what year is China's fertility going to be 1.9, 2031, uh, right? Yeah, so I give it 2031. I mean, I'm the, you know, I'm the only, um, you know, I talk to other smart people and I'm sort of out on the limb here. And, uh, you know, the other one, you know, other smart people, they either think it's impossible or they think the will is not going to be there on the China, in the part of the Chinese government. But, yeah, I take a different view and I explain it in my sub stack. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I'd make you a small bet on that if you're if you're willing. So, okay. uh, like, I'd give you, like, even uh, three to one odds. Yeah, that would be 1.9? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, be less than 1.9, yeah. Okay, well, 1.19 is my median, so if, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to take that. All right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll figure out the conditions later on, but. Sure. Um, um, oh, and then are you afraid that what these countries will do to actually increase fertility, if that'll have a dysgenic effect, right? So if it's just that, um, if it's cash transfers or it's just sort of economic incentive, you know, maybe it's the people on the margins who um, like desperately needed the cash for going to have more babies, and yeah. these are exactly the kind of people who, um, or um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question. I think that, you know, uh, so if you let's say the government uh, used went down the cultural path and just tried to propagandize people at um, you know the highest level to have as many kids as possible, right? Are smart people or stupid people more prone to propaganda? Um, I think. The argument could be made that smart people are. I mean, you look at wokeness. I mean, smart people tend to accept it a lot more than than stupid people. So maybe maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the smartest people will you know will take the hint you know most clearly and change their behavior, while the stupid people won't. Or maybe the stupid people you know the stupider um, you know are just sort of more. It might be different kinds of propaganda appeal to different kinds of people. So something like that's nationalistic might appeal disproportionately to stupid people. Or you know, and something like wokeness and like more you know it's more idealistic and sort of divorced from reality might appeal to smart people, but I don't think, you know, so that's one potential, you know, one potential issue, but I, I historically, um, if you look at like the way nationalism um, came about, it was the elites generally who, who were nationalistic first, and then it sort of trickled down to the masses. So there, I don't think there's necessarily a sort of a rule of human nature that anything sort of nationalist or right-wing propaganda necessarily only uh, disproportionately appeals to the, um, to the less intelligent. Uh, but it, it's a fascinating question, like what the, you know, compositional effects are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard to predict that, you know, like just, I think they'd get the birth rate up whether it'll be smart people or not smart people, I don't know. Right, it's, it's probably still net good in either case. Um, but it, I, I don't know about China, but like, for example, if the government tried to actually change the culture in America to make it more pro-natalist, I could like very well imagine that it would have a counterproductive effect because then it would become countercultural or um, or contrarian um, to like oppose a good right-wing government and like not yeah, have kids, yeah, right? Yeah, so it depends, on, it depends on like what, you know, what kind, so if like, yeah, if the Republican Party took power and said, oh, you know, we're, uh, our biggest thing is getting the fertility rate up, and it was like somebody like Trump who just triggered all educated people. Yeah, that that could probably that would probably backfire. Um, you know, it, it, so in some some place like China, I mean, I've seen some data that indicates that like the uh, elites and more educated are more nationalistic. So they could actually just you know they could be united in, in favor of uh, you know they could be very re potentially receptive to such a message. Um, it's so complicated because like it's like. 
China, I think Chinese elites see themselves as part of a country that's competing with the US, while US elites don't see themselves really as people competing with China, they see themselves as people, you know, competing with other Americans and or competing with, you know, nature and trying to change the world or get so you know, uh, social peace. So there's completely different dynamics there. And this might be one reason why sort of, you know, the West has become left wing as it's become more dominant and that like elites don't have anybody to compete with or, you know, uh, try to feel uh, uh, try to defeat or feel uh, feel superior to um, you know the Western uh, gap between you know in recent in uh, the decades of the World War II you know between the uh, Westerners and the and the rest of the world was so large that you know they weren't really seen as you know competition um, and that you know might change with the, you know, the rise of China but I don't think it's I don't think it's like really registered um, as something that's fundamentally shaped people's outlook um, so yeah it's um, yeah it's, it's, you know the compositional yeah the compositional um, you know, effects and sort of who's responsive to propaganda. Yeah, these are these are fascinating questions. I, I you know I think it's hard to predict in advance. You just you know you just have to sort of uh, <laughs> you, you just you know you watch what people do and then you know one thing the um, actually you brought up the uh, the economic point. So like there's um you know there's if you make like say a cra cash transfer for each child right like ten thousand dollars for example that matters a lot more to a poor person than a rich person. Now if you do something like um, you cut um, how much they're paying in taxes right. Um, and some, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, I think they did this in Quebec, and I think, um, and the Hungarian sort of system works like this too, where if you're getting tax breaks, the rich people pay more taxes. It could potentially be worth more to uh, to rich people um, to have more kids. So it's, um, yeah. So it, the structure of how it's set up would also matter quite a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, okay, final question: What should libertarians do uh, in order to win? So, like in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, given your theory of politics, uh, what should the libertarian strategy be? They should hope for ridiculous polarization. They should hope for Americans to hate each other uh, because libertarian ideas are unpopular. The only way you get them is you basically, you make them, uh, you take over the Republican Party and then they just win 50% of the time no matter what they do. Um, and they're gonna have to control certain states no matter what and they have a lot of more freedom to do unpopular things. Um, I think I think that I think that's I think polarization is actually good for libertarianism, and I think we might you know we might actually uh, they might have a good few decades actually. Right. That also, by the way, explains very well why wokeness has been winning in the last few decades, right? Because it's, increased polarization, they can get unpopular things fast. Yeah. Well, it's a cause and it's a consequence of polarization, right? Mm -hmm. So these things these things work together. Uh, I think what libertarians should do, and I think I, I'm doing a part of this, is they should really make clear to be so like there's this idea on like the populist right that like we tried libertarianism and now wokeness has taken over, and I'm like. Like, okay, when did Republicans repeal the Civil Rights Act? Like, when did that happen? When did they defund public edu education? Like, no, it, I, you actually haven't done right. anything close to libertarianism. And now you're making libertarianism the scapegoat right. um, for all these negative trends. So in my argument, uh, in my article, Local Institutions are, is just civil rights law, I try to make people, make people clear, like, conservatives haven't been libertarian enough. They haven't even talked about this stuff or understood um, the downstream effects of uh, broad interpretation of civil rights law um, on business and the wider culture. So, you know, I think people should have, you know, they, they should try, because people really are motivated by anti-wokeness. Um, some people are motivated by the idea of small government and what it can do, but you can reach people who are motivated by anti-wokeness, and that's a lot, a lot of people on the right. Um, and if you explain to them how libertarianism can help them and what they want to do anyway, I think that's a good strategy. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I, those are all the questions I had. Richard, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Pleasure. So yeah. yeah. It's been great.